So is it possible to know that God exists? Can we know this solely with the light of our natural reason? Or is belief in God's existence precisely that, a belief that is held but which cannot be rationally demonstrated? To answer these questions, let us go once again to Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas deals with the existence of God in several places in his works. In this lecture and in the next, we will draw mainly from his arguments in his Summa Contra Gentiles and Summa Theologica. Aquinas takes up the question of God's existence in the first part of the Summa Theologica, question 2. In particular, in article 2 of this question, Aquinas asks if it is possible to demonstrate that God exists. But since much of what Aquinas has to say on this subject presupposes an understanding of how we come to know things, we will have to first review a few points about his theory of knowledge. One important point about natural theology is that Thomas Aquinas considers it as human knowledge that can be attained, at least in theory, through the use of our natural powers of knowing. What's more, Aquinas considers this as having its origin in a natural desire to know the truth that has been impressed by God in human nature. In his commentary on Aristotle's Metaphysics, Aquinas examines Aristotle's claim that all men desire by nature to know the truth. For Aquinas, as it was for Aristotle, this is an important observation that leads to an explanation of how we know things and to a description of how we progress from sensible knowledge of material things to the contemplation of the highest principles of reality and God in the science of metaphysics. An important characteristic of human knowing is that although we have reason, our knowledge of things begins with the external senses. As with other animals, we have knowledge of things outside of ourselves through our external senses. With our power of sight, we see colors. Through our power of hearing, we hear sounds. With our power of smell, we smell odors. With our power of taste, we taste flavors. With our power of touch, we feel if something is hot or cold, dry or wet. These initial sensations are further elaborated in what Thomas calls the internal senses, especially in the imagination. To better understand this, let us take the knowledge of how we know a particular dog. We first come to know certain aspects of the dog through our external senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. These sensations are further elaborated in the internal senses, especially the imagination in which we form a concrete image or phantasma of the dog. This type of knowledge, which starts with the external senses and is developed by the internal senses, is called sensible knowledge and gives us knowledge of individual things. It is knowledge that we human beings share with other animals. In addition to sensible knowledge, human beings are, however, capable of a higher form of knowledge. This type of knowing distinguishes human beings from all other animals and is made possible by the fact that human beings have a higher power of knowing, namely intellect and reason. The fact that we have intellect and reason means that we are capable of abstraction or intellectual knowledge of things, 
aside from knowing individual things, we can understand what they are, we can grasp their essences. We arrive at intellectual knowledge of things in two steps. First, the natural light of our intellect illuminates the particular sense image that we have in our imagination. And second, through intellectual abstraction, we form an idea of what something is, of its essence. For example, when we sense something soft and brown that barks, we are able to know not just Rover, a particular individual dog, but we are able to abstract the idea of dog and understand what Rover is. This has important repercussions when talking about the nature of things. With our senses, we can know individual beings, Rover, Lassie, and Goofy. But with our reason, we can know that they are all of the same nature, the same kind of thing. They are dogs. Furthermore, this idea or concept is universal, which means it applies to several beings of the same kind. We can understand what Rover is, but we can also understand what Lassie and Goofy are. In short, we can understand that Rover and Lassie and Goofy are the same kind of thing, that they are of the same what, that they share the same essence. Abstract knowledge of universals is important because it makes it possible for us to have scientific knowledge of things. Because we know what something is, we can begin to seek explanations of why something is what it is. As we saw in the last lecture, Aristotle and Aquinas call these explanations causes and the knowledge of things through their causes is what we call a science. We also saw in the last lesson that there is a hierarchy of sciences in which some sciences are subordinated to and depend on other higher sciences. At the summit of human sciences, we find metaphysics, which is the science that studies being as being. Finally, Insofar as metaphysics seeks the causes of being, it begins to ask about whether there is a first cause of being, whether this first cause is what we call God, whether God exists, and whether or not we can know that he exists. And if he does exist, how can we know or say anything about him? To the extent that metaphysics seeks knowledge of God, it is called natural theology. All this leads to the question, can we know that God exists? And other questions, is God something I can know with my senses? If God is not sensible, how can I know if he exists? Isn't knowledge of God completely beyond my natural capabilities? Thomas Aquinas' answers to these questions involves rejecting two positions that he considers erroneous. In this section, we will examine these two positions and see why Aquinas rejects them. In the next lesson, we will study how Aquinas thinks we can demonstrate God's existence. The first position that Aquinas rejects is the one that holds that God's existence is evident per se to us and therefore does not require demonstration. According to this argument, 
the definition of God necessarily entails his existence. Thus, if one knows what the word God means, one knows what God is. If one knows what God is, and given that God is his being, it follows that God's existence is evident per se to us, and therefore does not need to be demonstrated. Aquinas rejects this argument because he holds that in this life we do not have direct knowledge of what God is. He does agree that if we had direct knowledge of God's essence, of what he is, then that God exists would be both evident in itself and evident to us. But since we do not have direct knowledge of what God is, that God must exist is not evident to us. Since God's existence is not evident to us in this life, we will have to try to demonstrate his existence by an argument that starts with beings that are evident to us namely material beings. If this can actually be done, and how it can be done, will be studied later. The second position that Aquinas rejects is the one that holds that since God is so far above the material beings that we co-naturally know, there is no way for us to know if God exists. Aquinas describes this objection in a passage from the Summa Contra Gentiles. If, as is shown in the posterior analytics, the knowledge of the principles of demonstration takes its origin from sense, whatever transcends all sense and sensibles seems to be indemonstrable. That God exists appears to be a proposition of this sort, and is therefore indemonstrable. A similar argument is heard today. We can only be certain of what we can measure and sense, and since the notion of God entails a non-material, spiritual entity that is therefore non-measurable, we cannot know God, and any attempt at getting to know him is irrelevant and futile. Aquinas' response to this is that while it is true that God completely surpasses the kinds of beings that we co-naturally know, that is, material beings, these beings are effects of God. And insofar as they are effects of God, it should be possible to come to know God as their cause. Again, exactly how this can be done will be seen in a later section. In this section, we have seen that Thomas Aquinas rejects two extremes. First, that God's existence is evident to us. And second, that knowledge of God is so far beyond our sense experience that we cannot know anything about him. However, as Aquinas argues against these two positions, the outlines of his own view of how we can demonstrate that God exists begins to take shape. This is the subject matter of the next section.